the 2015 Ford F-150 pickup, and this time we're not going to be talking about the aluminum body. Sergio Marchionne talks about the future, Paris briefly, and a whole lot of numbers. Auto Line After Hours is brought to you by Bridgestone, your journey, our passion. And by Hyundai. See what makes Elantra so nice. Check out its style, interior space, fuel economy, and popular features now. This is Auto Line After Hours with Gary Vaslash, episode 261 for October 10th, 2014. Under the hood of the 2015 Ford F-150. Watch AutoLine After Hours live at AutoLine.tv every Thursday at 6 p.m. Eastern Time or 2200 GMT. You can subscribe to this podcast for free by searching for AutoLine in iTunes, Stitcher, or by following the links on our website. Good evening, everyone. Uh, if you were watching me earlier, you can see that I did change. I did lose the tie, and so uh, we're ready to go with the show here. Um, first of all, I'd like to say hey to Frank Marcus, Motor Trend. How are you doing, Frank? Great, as always. Yeah. And, uh, what you been up to? You know, just living the dream. Uh, <laughs> F-150 was my last cool trip and the last uh, really important vehicle I drove. Right. Aside from that, I've been setting up a library over at the office, so yeah. kind of weird. And we've got Keith Nunn from Bloomberg. Keith. Hi, hey, Gary. How are you? Good. And Good. Uh, you're looking very business week. Well, sorry. That's not at all. That's uh, I'm not very after hour, hours anyway. Yeah, yeah. So. And here's our uh, special guest, Steve Gill, chief engineer of the uh, 2.7 liter engine at Ford Powertrain. Thank who, you very much for inviting me. Who is, Great who, to be here. Who has uh, even brought visual aids for us to... Uh, so. Frank mentioned that, that he was on the F-150 drive. I was on the F-150 drive last week, and my personal favorite engine was the 2.7. And I even said this before I knew you were going to be on the show. So, so, so tell us you about this. You talking for me. No. <laughs> so so this, this is an all-new engine, and this is the first application. Am I correct in that? Yeah, that's correct. So it's all new. Um, F-150 is the first, but we, we have announced it's going to go into Edge as well. And you, and you could expect to see it in some other products going forward. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, we're very proud of it. Um, we're expecting that customers are going to be surprised and delighted by it. I think that, you know, you, you've driven it. I think the surprise is in the performance, yeah. particularly in the F-150, uh, matched with the new aluminium-bodied F-150. <laughs> so uh, performance is great, 375 foot-pounds of torque and 325 horsepower. But on top of that, you're going to get great fuel. And actually, this engine is a, is a leading class for, you know, we call it NVH, but refinement. I don't know if you picked up on that as well, but some, some great technology to, to deliver that. And, and it's got a, uh, a CGI block. Is, and so, so tell us yeah. about that. This is, the, this is Ford's first CGI block in this market? It is. So this is the, uh, the prop. So this... Um, Combination is the, the block, which is this isn't the actual one, by the way. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a little small, but a little bit larger than that. Yeah. Demonstration purposes than only. It's a little bigger than a bread um, box. But this is the block shown in white here, uh, and this underneath is the ladder frame, and they do come apart, but they act as a unit. And CDI is a very high strength iron, so it's about twice the strength of standard grey iron. So that's compacted so graphite iron. Compacted graphite iron, yeah. High strength. And one of the aims of the engine was to make it very compact, both in uh, width and particularly in length. So we can put it in you know, cars in east-west, but also in, in the other applications. So it's a, it's a high strength, and you can probably see how thin these, yeah. these are. Mm -hmm. um, but we didn't want to make the whole block out of that. So we've coupled it, and this is a unique design, coupled it with uh, an aluminium ladder frame. And they lock together, they're bolted together, and you get this beautiful high strength unit. And that's really good for um, the strength of the, the, uh, the engine, but also the refinement. You don't get radiated noise out of this. Hmm. So it is the first application of compacted graphite iron in a gasoline, a volume gasoline engine. We have used it in our power stroke diesels. We've also used it in some of our European diesels, but first application. Mm -hmm. 
here and it, and it really gives us that compact shape and application. And for those of you who are not listening on the podcast, this, this is 3D printed? This one, yeah. Yeah, this is a 3D print. We use these quite a lot in our development. It's good for visualization. It's good for, you know, seeing what's going on. We have a, down in Dearborn, we have a center that does quite a lot of this for us. Mm -hmm. So if you had made the thing entirely out of aluminum, you probably would have been larger, right, to get the same strength for this direct injected high pressure turbo, you know, twin turbocharged engine. Is that fair to yeah, say? It would have been larger. It would have been longer in particular because you have to have the strength in the, the bulkheads to take the firing loads. So it would have been a longer engine. Uh, and, and also we wouldn't have been able to have this compact width. See, one of the things I was wondering about, though, is, is that so... So there's a, a five liter engine available for the F-150. Yeah. So, so there's, there's acres of space under that hood. Yet you guys concentrated on having a compact engine. So what's the advantage of that? Well, the advantage is F-150 is one of the applications. It happens to be the first. Um, and it's a great match for that vehicle, but you will see this in cars. So in the F-150, it's gonna be, you know, in, longitudinal, so down the length of the vehicle, and it goes in like that. But when we put it in the cars, uh, the east-west cars, it has to fit in sideways. Nah. So it has to be compact. Mm -hmm. and, and there are other uh, differentials, for example, that will mount to this, and we have to provide space for those. So. And how fuel efficient will it be? It's gonna be great. We haven't given out the numbers, I think right. you know. Right. They're coming out in November. And this will be but the most fuel-efficient power plant you'll offer? In F-150, this is going to be most fuel-efficient, yeah. And I am dying to see how it does in the real world, because I know that even though the, the, the U.S. Uh, you know, test regimen is a lot more realistic than any DC in Europe, which is laughable, uh, it does seem like that the downsized engines with turbos tend to do well on EPA and it'll be harder to, to duplicate in the real world. So I will be uh, very eager to see how that works out in, in real life. Yeah, you've got to get the engine matched to the vehicle. You don't want to go too small. You don't want to be too big. And we think we've got that matching right for the customers that are going to buy this type of vehicle, this type of engine for their usage. It just seems like, you know, once people get a, a feel of that 375 put, you know, pound feet, it's hard to keep them out of that, you know? And then, so if you run around a little more lead-footed, if it's no fun to, to floor a, a, a weak car, uh, they don't bother with it, you know? Right. Probably the 3.7, no one will, you know, hot rod around like yeah. that, but probably if you're, if you're into the 375 a lot, you're probably not gonna get the numbers from the state window sticker. But you'll probably get better numbers than that five. Probably. Here, so just, probably. Just, you just will. guessing. That's so, so when you first put an EcoBoost V6 in the outgoing F-150, yes. you, you encountered some derision, and people thought truckers would not buy a, a V6 yeah. engine. I think you even yourselves thought it would be maybe a 20% you know, take rate on it. It ended up being more than double that. So yeah, it's been huge. It's been huge, I think right? We've delivered 550,000. Right. F-150s with the 3.5 EcoBoost. And so it has been a phenomenal success. So is that the volume engine for the new F-150 well, we, then? Well, we're, we're anticipating that the new engine is going to share something similar. So probably with the 5 liter, the 3.5, the 2.7, we're anticipating they'll share a similar split. But we don't know. I mean, what I've seen from the write-ups you guys have been doing, this is getting a lot of attention. Mm -hmm. I think it's going to be very, very popular. So let's say I'm, I'm the family person who's just going to drive that thing around 300 days a year, 320, and I got to, but I want to hook up my, my Airstream for that one family vacation. I think it's good for, what, 8,500 pounds? Yeah, towing 8,500 pounds. When I'm towing 8,500 pounds of that thing, those turbos are cherry red the whole time, right? Those are, you're using the turbos all the time. Yeah, you're using the turbos for sure. Yeah. Yeah. And so you've done... Millions and millions. You've been to the moon and back several times. Durability testing. Yeah, yeah. I mean, everybody asks the question about durability, and of course we do thousands and thousands of hours of testing. You've probably seen we did that run on the Baja 1,883 miles through off-road course. Standard engine, no changes. Oil, oil filter, I think we changed. It's great. So the the durability is absolutely there. 
Now, you guys did some clever things in terms of, of how this, this engine is produced, um, in terms of the connecting rods and things like that. Could you talk about that a little bit, uh, the way? You're... Yeah, I mean, there's, there's a couple of things. Um, one is the split main bearing caps. So I can use my model again, but I think we've got some pictures. But normally bearing caps are you know, machined and you have two bolts. These, you, uh, we, it's cast as is, as you can see. We laser etch a notch and then crack them. And that's been done in Conrods for some time. It's the first application, again, in vol volume gasoline. And that gives you a very strong joint when you put it back together. So you need less weight, one, two bolts rather than four. Mm. So that's relatively unique and first for us. Uh, and on the Conrods, I don't have a model of that, but again, for assembly, uh, we split them at an angle. And that gives them a more compact shape, and you're able to assemble them through the bore. So, so this is all about being compact, all about high pressure um, that's, that's a piece of it, but uh, you know the, the whole industry is trying to take out weight, so we wanted to be very conscious of that as we went through, but with strength. Mm -hmm. Back to my question earlier about if you'd have made it all of aluminum and it would have been bigger, how much lighter would it have been? Probably not all that much, right? Because you had to add so much more aluminum? Yeah, not, not a lot, because you not only do you add the block itself, everything else gets longer to go with it, so the heads and the camshafts. So you're not just uh, saving the weight of the block, you're saving the weight of everything in the length of the engine. Mm -hmm. And does CGI lend itself to that cracking better than gray iron wood just because you start with powder? It seems like it would, but maybe I'm all wrong on that. Yeah, it does. It's, um, it's kind of not, it's a semi-nodular, and it, it's, uh, in certain ways it's brittle. And yeah. It does lend itself to that. Because you don't have to, like... Hit them with nitrogen or something before you crack no, it. No, or do you, you put a mandrel in, and it splits it. Yeah. Yeah. So you just use the yeah. force and just yes, yeah, breaks up and like yeah. that. So you know, as as you look at you know the development of, of engines going forward, I mean, do you do you see um, turbocharging as as just being a way of life for more and more engines? I think within Ford we do. You know, as we have we have a range. We offer a range of configurations and power. But we'll see as we go forward further turbocharging, different types of boosting as well, probably more electric boosting coming in as we go forward into the future. Mm -hmm. So certainly we see it as a, as a key piece of our engines and a key piece of our, our business going forward. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it, that engine, it seems like a technological marvel. It seems like you're breaking ground in a lot of ways. It's a premium engine in, in many regards. I wonder, as you were doing the business case for that engine, did you foresee it's a premium that consumers would be willing to pay, that they will recognize the advantages of a lightweight and refined engine and a fuel-efficient engine and be willing to pay for that? We think so. Um, the fuel efficiency step is great, and it's $495, I think we've offered, which is significantly less than other technologies you might choose for fuel, uh, and you get the, the performance as well. So we think the package that you're offering between fuel economy, uh, performance, and cost is going to give customers real value and exactly what they want. And in this application, it's got start-stop technology. This has auto start-stop combined with it, yeah. It's not mm -hmm. part of the engine is it itself, right. but it's uh, part of the package in F-150, yes. Mm -hmm. And does it have any effect on the engine, or is it just the battery side and the starter side that um, uh, it, has a change? It does. We, have, we, uh, we design the engine to be able to take that number of stops and starts. So, for example, we do 240,000 stop-start tests on the engine. You know, we designed the bearings to be very robust to that continual stopping and starting. So certain things we have to adjust. So if you didn't well. have start-stop, what would you test it to? If you do 240 for that? It would be significantly less for, for that particular type of test. Uh -huh. yeah, you know, less than 10,000. Uh -huh. So it's a big, a big step as it needs to be. Mm -hmm. I forget, there is an off button to turn that system off, but it defaults on, right? It does, yeah. You have, you have the choice, um, and it, it goes off in certain modes if you're towing, for example. It's not, it's not automatically on. It's something on mountains, I think, that it, it shuts yeah. off. So, yeah. um, so do, do you think that's a, a, another thing that's going to become more prevalent in vehicles going forward in terms I do. of powertrain? I do, because if you look in Europe, certainly, 
It's on a lot of powertrains, a lot of our powertrains, and it's uh, again, it's for, for the customer. It's a, a cost-effective way of, of gaining fuel, and it's very. You, I mean, you've driven it. I, I think it's very inintrusive on the F one fifty. And what what's the estimated fuel savings with with that? Just the start-stop technology. Is it four or five percent? What do you, what do you get? You know, I don't know that off the top of my head. What's the EPA credit? Because it doesn't show up on the FTP 75 fuel economy test, per se, but they give you a, a cafe credit for having it. Isn't that correct? Yeah, I don't, I don't, I'm not sure what the credit value is, but yes. Because it varies for everybody if you do a lot of in-town. Yeah, particularly if you're, you know, if you're using a truck and you're doing a lot of stop-start delivery type work, it's going to be great. So, so when you were probably more, you know, you're asking about real world, more in the real world than on the test. Yeah, yeah. So, so when you were working on this engine, okay, so you're working on the F-150 truck program, and, and here you are working on a six-cylinder engine. Didn't people say to you, why not eight, why not 10, why not 12? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, of course, we've got six cylinders in F-150 today. Yeah, but I mean... Who are these people? Yeah, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Journalists? <laughs> you know, when, when Probably. we're... Well, when, you, when you're designing an engine from scratch, actually the way it starts is to say, what is, the, what is the output we want for the customer? And that's normally in performance is one aspect, and fuel is another, and of course cost is another. And, and you normally then decide on displacement, so how big, you know, how big does the engine need to be? In this case, 2.7 would meet all of those criteria. And from that, then we can you know, decide on configuration, six cylinders, and then design the engines. Mm -hmm. So yeah, you could put a 12 cylinder in, but it isn't gonna be what most of the customers are gonna want. Mm -hmm. And it probably couldn't fit when you had to it turn it down. It'd be a struggle. <laughs> and even the 10, I, 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 I never liked that 10 very much when the trucks had a 10 cylinder available. And the, we have the 10 cylinder, yeah, we have 6.8 liter 10 cylinder. Yeah, they still like but this. I was in a machine tool builder yesterday and saw it's they were re popular. refurbishing yeah. some of the equipment for Windsor for the, uh, yeah. it's, the 10 it cylinder. It does very well. Yeah. I, I don't yeah. like it. Yeah. it. Sounds weird. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, there's been kind of this sea change in how truckers view things, right? I mean, it used to be everything big was better, bigger engine, bigger whatever. And you guys seem to have proved with the, with the first round of V6 EcoBoost that that doesn't necessarily appeal anymore. Yeah, I think you've got a range of customers, and it's great to offer the customers some choice because not everybody's going to want a six-cylinder, as you say. Um, but if you look over a period of time, there's certainly change, I think. Change in weight, change in engine size, for sure. And, and that's driven by customer wants, and it's also driven by legislation. If this engine had come out first and the 3.5 were being developed later, do you think they would look at a CGI for that one too? Or does that one, because it's also used for racing and other things, does that one just really want to be aluminum? You need an aluminum one for everything that that, that, that one wants to do. Um, as I say, we could do either from a technical point of view, but this had some specific drivers in terms of what we wanted to achieve with this engine and with the vehicles it's going to go into. So... It's not a matter of what we could do or what we could deliver with the engine as such. It was achieving all the aims of the engine. Is there a racing future for this one? It's a good question. Um, don't know yet. It has the capability though, right? Yeah, for sure. Mm -hmm. for sure. Particularly with this, you know, the, the core is very, very strong. So have you, have you worked on V8 engines? Have you worked on I4 engines? Yeah. Have you, so you've worked yeah, on... Yeah, sorry, I should have said I'm chief engineer for all North American engines. Or so, American gasoline, I should say. So, so from, the, from your point of view, I mean, do you see engines like this eclipsing V8 engines in this market? Uh, we, we think that the volumes of V8s are gradually declining, yeah, in this market. And we're seeing more of the smaller engines coming through. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Do, do, does uh, stable gas gasoline prices, which we've had for about three years now, um, change at least the rate of adoption? I think it can because ultimately the consumers are the ones making the choice and, and they are clearly influenced by gasoline prices because if it's going to four dollars or above right. and people start to make different choices. So. Right. Okay yeah. so we hear the music and with that we'll be uh, taking a break at this moment here and uh, 
hear from one of our sponsors. Introducing a car company that's never made a single car. We took the power of a nine-year-old V8 and gave it the impressive handling of Firestone's destination tire. Now, moms agree, every milk run feels like a victory lap. So whatever you drive, drive a Firestone. Okay, we're back, and uh, so here with uh, Steve Gill, who is in uh, charge of Ford Powertrains for North America, and we got a whole bunch of questions here. So we're going to start with a phone call from Delmont, oh, PA. No, no. Nope, we're not going to start with a phone call. Not yet. All right. So Steve B. wants to know, what transmission is mated to the 2.7? So the 2.7's got our six-speed auto. Uh, it's been around for a little while. It's proven. It's durable. It's great. It's a really good match. Okay. So I think, Steve, you'd be happy with that. All right. Rock A, are you expecting smaller diesel engines for the United States? That's a, I mean, that's a good question, and it often comes up about what will happen on diesel, and it's back to your question about f fuel prices right. and value. And we've got a great history on diesel in, in Ford. We've got R6, 7. We've got a lot of engines in Europe. So it, it's back to what I said, I think, about offering customers value. We think through EcoBoost, you, know, you get the performance, you get good fuel, but you don't get the cost of a diesel. And I think when I was driving down tonight, you know, outside, diesel's like 60 cents a gallon higher. Right. So it's 15, you know, we're talking 15% right. cost. It's, it's quite hard, I think, to make a, a business case. I think you'll see some, for sure. You know, there are always people who want that, but, mm -hmm. you know, we think this is a really good balance between fuel, performance, and mm -hmm. cost. Okay. All right, now we're going to bring that phone call in from Delmont, PA. Yes, this is Clem Zorowski from Delmont, Pennsylvania. My question on the uh, Ford engine is, I understand that you people recommend premium fuel when you're using these turbocharged engines for towing, heavy towing. Is this true? Thank you. Thank you for the question. No, it's not. Actually, all the EcoBoosts are designed for regular fuel. So the ratings I was talking about, the 375 and the 325 horsepower, are with regular fuel. You can use premium, and you'll get some more power. You get you know, another 10 or 15 horsepower if you wanted to do that. But you don't need to for towing or for anything else. Um, rum and Coke, since you're using start-stop technology, are you also researching supercapacitors to save the battery? Wow, that's a good question. It's slightly outside my uh, direct area, so right. I can't help on that one. You guys can help. Questions too. If something occurs, just, I just don't want like you to think that I'm reading rum and coke. I thought that was awesome. Made me thirsty. Yeah. <laughs> but on the last one, is it E85 compa compatible? I can't remember. Uh, E20. Okay. We signed off for. VRM Chris, Chris wants to know: Are the cylinders themselves made from cast iron pressed in, or cast along with the aluminum block? So the blocks compact graphite iron, and the. The bores are compact graphite iron, so it's the parent bore. There's no liner added. You weren't tempted to spray aluminum in there or anything, just to... <laughs> not, <laughs> not, not even for fun. No. <laughs> and the pistons are made out of? Aluminum. Yeah. Aluminum, I should say. <laughs> um, Armand wants to know, what RPM do the turbos spin at idle, and how much boost do they produce? Good question. Idle, typically they're maybe 30,000 RPM, something like that, pretty, pretty low. Mm -hmm. Turbos will go up to 250,000 RPM. Mm -hmm. and, and little boost to idle at, at uh, rated power, something like 13 PSI we, we run on this engine, mm -hmm. gauge pressure. Uh, Armand, oh uh, no, we just asked that one. Uh, Dan the Man, what is the next engine after the 2.7? That's a great question, but and I wish yeah, I could talk about it. Okay. <laughs> of course, per, I'm not allowed. Performance version. Um, will the 3.5 liter EcoBoost get the nano treatment? I, I don't know what the nano treatment is. Maybe that's spraying something or other, or uh, it's an internal reference oh. for the the name of the engine. So uh, 
No, no, the three, the three, the three five's got its own d development. It's a well-established engine. It's uh, really respected in the market. So, I think that's what he means. So, you can, can you give a, give away what this nano is or uh... the CGI? This idea. No, it's just all our engines internally have oh. code names. Oh, and it happened to be called that. This was called that. Yes. Wow. And was that because it was small? Mm. Yes. Mm. Very interesting. It's a bit of insider there. Yeah, indeed. Um, what, uh, Vic wants to know, what is the oil capacity and the weight of the motor oil? Um, the weight. So 5W30, so it's what we put in all our eco boosts, and we, we um, standardize on six quarts. And um, JM1NB, what is the weight difference between the 3.5 echo boost and the 2.7 echo boost? I don't think I know that off top of my head, but the 2.7 is lighter. It's lighter than the V8, and the, the 3.5 sits in between the two. And, and he's got a wealth of questions here, assuming it's a he, not a she, could be a she, we don't know. Um, is the 2.7 designed on a modular platform, could 4s and 8s, 10s and 12s be in the cards? He's obviously paying attention to this. He is paying attention. Um, I probably wouldn't comment on that at this All point. Right. Uh, blah, 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 blah. blah. Um, guest 099 wants to know, how come there are so many four-cylinder Echo Boost engines? How are they better suited to each application? So in our range, it's a good question, in our range we have one litre, one five, which is actually replacing the one six over time. So we have a one five and we have the two litre and the two three. So the, the, uh, the one litre is actually three cylinder and the others are four cylinder. As I said, you've got to you, you have to match the engine to the vehicle. So you don't want it to be too big or too small. And EcoBoost is great because you can use it for fuel economy in a slightly larger application or you can use it for performance, you know, like in our Fiesta uh, ST, mm -hmm. it's the 1.6, it's great. Okay. Well, with that, you guys got anything? We're pretty good. Nice thank engine, you. Steve. And uh, thank you for bringing the models it's here. It's been a pleasure. And uh, that's that's very very clever, very cool. And uh, thank you so for having for, me. So for everybody who is uh, wondering, so you guys you guys are not going to be printing engines anytime soon, right? Not as far as I know. Not as far as you know, and and you would know if anybody would know. And I don't think even the engine in that local motors thing was printed, right? No, I don't think so. No, there's <laughs> no you can't print engines. Just for show. But you could, but it would take so long to print an engine. And, Anyway, with that, Steve Gill, Ford Motor Company, powertrain, 2.7 liter engine. It, it, and for all of you out there, I mean, Frank's driven it, I've driven it. It's, it's really a great engine. So, and we're not, I'm not blowing smoke, and I don't think Frank was either. So, thanks for being on the show tonight. Thank you. Appreciate it. it. Thanks. thanks, Gary. And uh, so now, you may have missed this earlier this week on Autoline.tv, so we're going to show you what you may have missed. Have you seen what's been happening with our other shows lately? Here's this week's auto lineup. On Monday, John's commentary focused on the new knockdown drag out truck fight brewing between Ford and GM. Then on Tuesday, we talk Tesla, the debut of its new technology, as well as the loss of its VP of communications. And on Wednesday, you heard the NADA chairman from our own Autoline studios welcome billionaire Warren Buffett to the fraternity of auto dealers. For more details on these shows and others, click over to our website or YouTube channel. And don't forget our latest episode of Autoline this week, featuring everything you want to know about lightweighting. All that and more on Autoline.tv. You have way better socks than I do. <laughs> okay, so we're camera. back with uh, Keith and Frank. Um, Keith, Bloomberg did some uh, interesting reporting this, this week about... Uh, Sergio Marchionne, uh, he made some rather interesting comments both about his future and about what he sees the future of the auto industry being. So could you tell us a little bit about that? Right. Uh, yeah, he is um, essentially announcing his retirement date of 2018. He says he's uh, done all the turning around he wants to do, and he will turn it over to uh, the other young punks, I think he said. Plural. To, to handle from there. I think he does see... Uh, it taking more than one person to replace him. 
So, so okay, so that that whole thing of, of you know that this this you know I may not be directly replaced. It is he's saying it's not his responsibility to make the determination who would replace him, but it seems likely that he would not be replaced by one person. Is is that hubris or is that just basically? Uh, well, that's Sergio, is, baby. Is, is, <laughs> I mean, but but what do you guys think? I mean. Could a single guy do what he does? Because he has also just sort of taken over Luca de Montezemolo's job as well. So he's, you know, aggregating even more power. And then, of course, nobody, one person, yeah. can do this. Well, but the answer is yes, of course, a single guy could do what he does. His name is Carlos Gong. Mm -hmm. So you can run two companies on two continents and uh, be successful. So he's it, had a lot of defections lately. Well, but over time, I mm -hmm. think uh, you'd have to say, given where Nissan was 15 years ago and where it is today. Yeah, and I, 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 I thought it was interesting that, that so just a few days before this, um, you know, you mentioned Ngoen, and, and, and Ngoen and Dieter Zecha were in Paris, and, and they were basically talking about the Renault-Nissan slash Daimler alliance and, and how they have these programs working. And, and I was wondering whether that might have... Uh, instigated uh, Mark Ioni to be talking about uh, his future and uh, what he sees as the future of the auto industry. Well, um, you know, I always feel like Mark Ioni's pretty unfiltered. And uh, he's made hints in the past that, that you know, he may um, be gone after this cycle, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, so, but he put a finer point on it this, this time around. And um, I guess with all of these, you know, great and charismatic rock star leaders, my attitude is, I'll believe it when I see it. Mm -hmm. And, and he, he, he said in, in one of the pieces, there is room to create one guy which will be bigger. And he's not talking about an individual. He was talking about a company. That right. He was talking about a company that could become bigger than Toyota in terms of its footprint in, in the global world. Now, what's your take on that? I mean, is he just throwing out speculation, or is there a possibility that... Uh... Well, anytime a CEO of a company that would benefit from aligning with somebody else says something like that, you have to think he has something in mind. Uh, you know, um, he sees consolidation still to come. He sees Fiat Chrysler becoming, you know, what, the sixth largest automaker in the world, which would supplant Ford, right? Um, so, um, you know, he, he s clearly sees them... I think that seems like more than organic growth. Mm -hmm. So um, he sees them getting larger and larger through um, merger or acquisition. And so, so it, it seems that, that he's saying that you can have basically a half dozen companies and, and that's pretty much it in terms of global players. And that the, Major. Yeah. That the, the, the scale necessary in order to have mass market car programs is, is not something that a smaller company could take on. Right. Um, but I mean, BMW. <laughs> so what do you think, Frank? I mean, do you, do you think that you, I mean, could you see any of the players that we now know getting together in a, in a way that goes beyond an alliance, the, the way that Renault, Nissan, and, and, and Daimler have an alliance? I mean, it's interesting. They're making engines together, and, and they're make, developing car platforms together. I mean, the Smart 4.2 and the Twingo are going to, are on the same platform. Uh, you know, you've got the engines that are going into C class, or will also be going into Infinities. I mean, it uh, does seem like that m you know model makes more sense. Let's you know keep all the financials and everything more or less separate, but let's save money where we can and co-develop these things. And there are a lot of those plans in the works, as you, as you say. Now, you know, yeah, I mean, I wouldn't be at all surprised if Aston Martin gets swallowed up by. You know, Mercedes or something like that. That's a but yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, Fiat though. Ooh, I don't know. That's well, it, like I say, he's working on it. It seems what you need to be a um, healthy global automaker is you need a footprint in Asia, and you need some sort of luxury, volume luxury, not not Aston style luxury, volume luxury uh, brand, because those are the two big growth areas. Otherwise, you're in a static to shrinking. Situation. And the French, I mean, how, how long can they, you well, know, get along with their footprint? Uh, you know, it's it, there's a lot of government support there. Yeah. So that's what that's what keeps them going. Um, but no, that's not sustainable. 
So what Fiat Chrysler needs is clearly a bigger footprint in Asia. They don't have much there at all. Um, they, hope, they have high hopes for Jeep, and I think the, that that has a great deal of potential. But the other thing you need in China besides Jeep is you need a luxury brand, a, a legitimate luxury brand. And I think GM and Ford are both showing how difficult it is to have a legitimate luxury brand. Mm -hmm. Because and the Chinese love German luxury when it comes to cars. And it was disappointing to hear the, the move for Chrysler brand to you know, down, basically be a, a mainstream you know, never anything bigger or nicer than a 300. You know, I was kind of sorry to hear that for the same reasons you're, you're mentioning there. That's where all the big growth is. But well, it was interesting. I mean, it, se it seemed that 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 one of the points he was making is is that each brand has to have something very distinctive about it. Mm -hmm. And so, if we, if we were to say look at in if we get to the sales numbers, um, if if we look at Dodge, Dodge is doing very well. Muscle car. Jeep is doing very well because it's Jeep. Ram is doing very well because it's truck. Chrysler is doing very unwell because it's, I don't know. Right. I mean, what is it? What's its reason for being? Right. And, yeah. and then so then he could go to Alpha and say, you know, this is the, more of a luxury brand. You know, everybody knows what Ferrari is. Um, what else? And, and, and Fiat, he's trying to make the argument that Fiat is a, you know, cute Italian car. And uh, so one of the things that... Uh, you might talk about, Frank, uh, the, the Fiat 500X that was introduced in Paris. Yes, although, we and I heard a lot about it today for the U.S. market, but that's all embargoed. Not, so I'm a, kind of a little bit of afraid to talk about uh, 500X for, for, for getting in trouble uh, on, on the embargoes. That is being, the, the North American debut is November 19th or mm -hmm. 20th uh, at the L.A. show. But yeah, I mean, basically, you know, it's built right alongside the, you know, the the uh, Renegade, but it, with a, an on-road, you know, all-weather, you know, emphasis instead of the Rubicon emphasis of the Jeep and whatever. And uh, I think they do expect that to be, you know, kind of the the halo, uh, you know, of the the brand over here, and to help continue separating people from money that's a lot higher than anything else in the B segment. You know, they're household income numbers are, are you know, way above, you know, Fiestas and mm -hmm. Sparks and <laughs> Sonics, you know, mm -hmm. so. Yeah, and it was, it, you know, it's also, I mean, it seems that, that you know, the, the Renegade and the 500X, they're saying, okay, it was a, it was a co-development of the platform and, and that it costs about a third if you develop something off an existing platform. Right, sure. And then they were also saying that about 40% of the parts are shared between the two things. And so it's, it's all about, you know, getting, getting volume, getting scale, and reducing cost, it right. seems, in, in, in his mind. And, uh, Which was the idea of kind of, that, that was the advantage for Fiat of taking on Chrysler back when Chrysler was a basket case. Mm -hmm. So maybe they're starting to realize that now. Mm -hmm. So um, he, he also, I also didn't realize that he was a big poker player. And, and it, it said in the, uh, in, in the in the Bloomberg story that uh, apparently he makes everybody play poker when he's flying back and forth across the Atlantic, and so I'm speculating World Poker Tour is a uh, <laughs> that's where he's going in 2018 possible future yeah, exactly yeah, he'll right he'll get the shades because so. he says he wants time to think and I mean you know you right. see those guys behind those glasses you know that's all right. they're doing is thinking back right. there and, right uh, the tumblers are turning exactly so uh, Paris. Uh, was there any big announcement in Paris? Was there any car that you guys, the, you know, you guys at Motorstrand are going, holy moly? Well, no, it, it was a little bit leader. quieter, you know, show that way. Of course, the, the big splash for the enthusiast market was the, the Lamborghini Asterium. Um, and there's some numbers of 910, LP 910-4 or whatever it is. Um, but that's their their answer, obviously, to the Porsche 918 and the Ferrari La Ferrari and you know, McLaren P1, all these hybridized things. So it does have a hybrid, but and they are going more along the line, at least this concept. Who knows if they'll make it uh, of the Porsche? So it is a, really a plug-in hybrid. So it actually they claim 31 miles of EV range to the thing, which is you know pretty impressive. Uh, 5.2 liter V10, like you see in other cars, 602 horsepower, but then with 295 horsepower between the electric motors, uh, they're up to like 897 SAE horsepower, so pretty cool. And we're gonna go to a break. 
So we'll be right back. Nice. Not nice. The new Elantra from Hyundai. Nice. Whether it's on television, online, or through social media, AutoLine knows how to effectively get your marketing message to the people you want to reach. Contact Stacy Eman today. Okay, we're back with uh, Frank Marcus and Keith Naughton. Um, we were talking a little bit about Paris and uh, the Lamborghini Asterion LPI 919. That's the uh, okay. words you're looking for. Yeah, whatever. And it has a V10 engine, so back to my question earlier about <laughs> V10s that was not completely folly. Um, you know, I thought it was interesting that, that many of the concepts that were introduced are all hybrids. Yeah. Is, is this addressing the uh, Europe, European CO2 dictates? Uh, I, I think maybe people, you know, as the, everyone's now facing tighter and tighter particulate emissions, and so forth. The, de the bloom is still slightly coming off of the diesel, even over there a little bit. And some people are going, eh, we might need to do this. And, and I, I think on global basis, the hybridization, you know, might be starting to, you know, gain a little favor. Hmm. So, yeah, it was, it was always my sense that that the Europeans were saying diesel's the way to go. The Japanese were saying that hybrids are the way to go. The Americans were saying. The Americans Whatever. are, are saying, is cheap. yeah, Who they're cares? saying the SUV is the way to go. Yeah. yeah. And the hell with hybrids. Yeah. And, that's, uh, that's essentially what you're hearing from Americans. Uh -huh. they, they, you know, you saw the EPA just came out with the latest fuel economy thing, and I guess their headline was it was an all-time record. Right. The real story is it only improved by one-tenth of a mile per hour, whereas the previous year it had improved by a half a mile an hour. So the mile growth per has, gallon. Mile per gallon, excuse me. Right. Uh, the growth has slowed dramatically because we have fallen in love again with the SUV. Yeah, I, th I thought it was sort of funny. So, so w what Keith is referring to is the EPA came out with some numbers today and they, they did this study. Uh, the annual light duty automotive technology tr uh, carbon dioxide emissions and fuel economy trends. And so they, they reported that model year 2013 vehicles achieved an average of 24.1 miles per gallon, a 0.5 mile per gallon increase over the previous year, and an increase of nearly five miles per gallon since 2004. Fuel economy has now increased in eight of the last nine years. And then I thought it was very funny is almost coincidentally with that, that uh, the University of Michigan Transportation Research Institute came out with a release that said, gas mileage of new vehicles sold in the U.S. posted its largest <laughs> drop in nearly three years. Exactly. <laughs> and then it gets exactly back to what you're saying about the sales of, of SUVs. And don't look for it to change. On the way over here, I heard a, a radio piece saying that, you know, with the Saudis kind of doing a price war on, on oil, you know, they're, they're, they're reckoning 275 could be the the norm here in the near future. And here's the thing, the trend of small SUVs growing has been going on for a long time. People are moving out of, essentially sedans, they're moving out of Camrys and Fusions into Escapes and CRVs. That, that's one thing. But what's really going on right now is the jumbos are back. Mm -hmm. If you looked at all of GM's large SUVs last month, the Escalade more than doubled in sales. And the Yukon was up like 80%. These things are flying off the, the lot. And they're brand new, and so there's people that were waiting for the new one, and, and that might you know, not be sustainable throughout the life of that car, but it uh, certainly I, isn't going to go down while the gas prices stay so low. Yeah, what, what, uh, Yukon up 93.5% in, in low. September. Yeah, but I mean, but 62.3% for the year. For the year. And, and here's the thing, it, <laughs> gas prices now have dipped below $3 in some places, but it's not just what's happened at the pump in the last month or last two months or even the last six months, it's what's happened over the last three years. You know, we went through this period in the OOs where we had, you know, the seesaw of prices. You know, it would change by a dollar in the course of a couple months. Mm -hmm. That has not happened since the recession. Right. What we've had is very stable gas prices in a band between three and 375. It really hasn't changed much. And that's what changes consumers' psyches. Mm -hmm. It's not filling up once at 299 a gallon. It's filling up over the long haul. So when you visualize yourself buying an SUV and owning it for the next four or five or seven years, 
you think, well, you know, gas prices aren't going to change much. So I, ca I can buy this thing and I'm not taking a risk. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you bought one back in 2008 and prices had done what had, what had been going on, you'd think, oh my gosh, if I buy one now, it's going to be $8 a gallon by the time right. I'm trying to trade this thing in and, and I won't be able to sell it to anyone. So the, the mindset has changed entirely and that's why the SUV is back. We always loved them to begin mm -hmm. with. And now it's okay to love them. And now we're just being forced to pay more when they ladle it on all these other technologies to get the, <laughs> the fuel economy down to some arbitrary number that the government's trying to throw down, mm -hmm. you know. And, and so you just pay more for what you wanted to begin with. And, and you know, but it's interesting. I was, I was in Europe a couple of weeks ago, and, and gas prices are still very high over there. It's all tax over there. Yeah. And... Uh... But and I mean, they are in Japan too. But I mean, but, but do you guys see this as 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 running the danger that was um, that this this industry had experienced when they created the wherewithal to build lots of large vehicles, and then then we had the oil crises, and suddenly these plants were being well. That, that's all. It's, that's always a risk. But what you hope first is that they've learned from their history mm -hmm. uh, and don't put all their eggs in one basket as they did before. But also. Manufacturing is far more flexible now. Look what we were just talking about with with the Renegade. Uh, you know, apply that to everything. How many vehicles does Ford get off its C platform? It's in the millions. You know, and so so you can you can take a C platform, you know, a compact platform, and build a little car off of it, or build an SUV off of it. Hmm. It used to be, if you were going to have an SUV factory like the old you know Ford truck factory here that built, you know, as the world's most profitable factory in 1999. It built the Navigator and the, the es Excursion and the, uh, what was the other big one? The other E big uh, one. Uh, Expedition. Expedition. Expedition, thank you. Um, but that's all you could build, you know, and as soon as, you know, the market turned, that plant went from being the world's most profitable to an albatross. Right. Now, if a, a market turns, you just dial down the, the escapes and dial up the, you know, focuses. Right. Uh, and, and, and you're okay. Except for the fact that if you're, if you're building F-150s or you're building Silverados or you're building Yukons, you're not building anything else in those plants because you just can't. I mean, just the, which, the architecture. Which is why there are so few people building them. Now. You know, and, and so the architectures are so different. But, I mean, you just see this, this heat that seems to be generated by, you know, these full-size trucks and the profitability. I mean, you know, that, I mean, I was astonished maybe you were as well, Frank, but I mean, the platinum version of the F-150, I mean, yeah. geez, oh man, I mean, this was this was seriously luxe. And I mean, it's, it's and, uh, 60K and above, right? Exactly. Sure. And, uh, and, you know, you're seeing, you know, Ram's got its version. Um, you've got um, high-end Silverados. You've got... High country, yeah. Yeah, um, the Toyota, Tundra, whatever they're... Yeah, I think they're platinum too. It's popular metal. Nobody nowadays. must have, uh, yeah, patented that or yeah. trademarked that right. name. No, well, I mean, you know, it, it it speaks to the demographics of truck buyers. It speaks to the profitability of automakers mm -hmm. that they're selling pickup trucks mm -hmm. for, you know, E class and five series prices. Well, and the, and the building trades have, have improved. You know, you know, their their fortunes have gone up, and so you can justify it yourself. Oh, I, I need this platinum one for, with the built-in Wi-Fi and all this stuff. I can have my mobile office here. I right. hang my folders in here and everything. It'll be great. You know? Yeah. I, th I thought it was very funny. You know, speak, speaking of that, that you know, mobile hotspot, and, and, and so, so one of our colleagues was, was saying, I don't believe this, this, you know, the F-150 doesn't have a mobile hotspot. And I was thinking, wow, how, how times have changed whereby that becomes something that is, is of keen interest in a pickup truck, yeah. right? It, it, he didn't seem to be too concerned about the towing. He didn't seem to be too concerned about the size of the box back there. He seemed to be concerned about whether or not he'd be able to, uh, you know, hook up his uh, computer to the, to the vehicle or well, not. Well, you've seen the Chevy ad with the pickup truck guy sitting outside his truck Skyping his mother. <laughs> I didn't see that. So, Really, would you have seen that in a truck ad a, yeah. a few years ago? Uh, or GLDE, it's uh -huh. a product differentiator for General Motors. Well, so, well speaking, speaking of things like that, uh, do you guys see the, uh, the study that AAA came out with the, uh, um, that basically is saying that uh, um, popular vehicle features such as um, the whole telematics infotainment right. systems are, uh, are not so good in terms of uh, 
um, drivers driving safely. And I thought this was very funny that, so th they, they had this study that was, was done for them uh, by the University of Utah. And this, this cracks me up. The team used a five category rating system which they created in 2013 similar to that used for hurricanes. hurricanes yes. And then so basically they're, they're saying that, uh, um, you know, as, so as you go up, and, and this was, I thought this was, this was an astonishing kicker, that they uh, discovered that the, and now this is iOS 7 for all of you Mac people out there. The research uncovered that hands and eye-free use of Apple's Siri generated a relatively high category four level of mental distraction. Yeah, it was huge. Right, so five is as high as they go, right? right? And so Siri is generating four. Um, I, I talked to them about this and it's- About it, app, to Apple or to AAA? To AAA, and, uh, and it's because Siri fails so much. You know, when, when, Siri, when she fails you in your hand, it's one thing, I guess, it's a certain level of sadness. <laughs> but when she fails you on the road, it's dangerous. So, um, so, but from what the AAA people, again, I did not talk to the Apple people said, um, you know, the things they tested were like updating your Facebook. These are things you really should not be doing in, the, in a moving vehicle. Um, and apparently with, with CarPlay, Apple's car application, those things will be locked out while you're moving. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and what will be available to you on Siri while you're moving will be very limited. The sorts of things that are currently available mm -hmm. through voice activation, nav and phone and radio. And it'll read texts, right? It will read and it will take dictation. But, but really you shouldn't be dictating your um, Facebook status or tweeting. Right. Yeah, it's interesting. So, so category one is just listening to the radio. Right. Okay, so that's that's that. And your... back in the twenties or something, you know, people were up in arms. This is be carnage. <laughs> people were listening to radio. Um, talking on a handheld, handheld or hands-free cell phone, category two. Uh, using an error-free speech-to-text system to listen to and compose emails or texts is category. Theoretically, because there is error no free. thing. Error-free. Yeah. Error-free is is the rub there. So, so okay, so in 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 they're looking at at real live system, so we're not just going to be jumping on Siri here. So uh, five point scale, Toyota's Entune system garnered the lowest cognitive distraction, 1.7. So Toyota's Entune system is the best. Um, it's the only one down in that, in that category. And, and they, they said it compared to the, the Entune system, they said is the equivalent of listening to an audio book. So it's right. harmless. But they tried, they tested five other automakers, as you have in front of you, and all of them were, were major distractions. Was well, that because Antune does not do very many things? Exactly. Or? It's really simple, and it doesn't feel much. They said the key to it is that it worked the first time, so that you don't get all angry and frustrated, and, and that, it, that it's intuitive. So if you keep asking for a radio station and it keeps changing your navigation location, you know, you get pretty upset. And, and that's another form of driver distraction, road rage. In, inward focused road rage. Right, right. The road rage at your car. Yeah. Having an argument with your car is a bad thing. So, so is, I mean, isn't it interesting that, that we're to the point where, whereby, you know, earlier in the show we're talking about compacted graphite iron to make, make engines and, and, and things like that, and then it gets to the point where the, the overarching consideration is whether or not there is a capability of being able to get all kinds of information as you're driving your car that doesn't have to do with the amount of gas you have in your car or whether you need to change your oil or how fast you're going. Yeah, and unfortunately, going forward, way more people will care about that connectivity aspect of the car than whether the engine's made out of CGI. <laughs> yeah, they, I, I won't know. I did a whole story last month just on voice activation in cars and, and because it's one of the, it is the number one complaint in J.D. Power's uh, initial quality survey. I talked to a bunch of people who, you know, are constantly arguing with their car, but they wouldn't have it any other way. And one of them said, sometimes you're just going to have to argue with your car to get things done because they want the voice activation. <laughs> to just, get uh, things done? To get things done. They want to be totally connected. They want to be able to speak into thin air and have their car do things for them and connect with the outside world. Mm. That is as important to them as, as those engines that we were looking at earlier. Mm. That is the future. So how does Motor Trend feel about that? 
Well, I mean, we do try and assess it, mostly in our long-term vehicle fleet, because with each of those you know, 12 or 13 cars a year, one single editor spends most of the time with that vehicle, so they have a good chance to you know, to really get to, to use that. Now, some people just, I just don't like to talk to them. I, I have not talked to Siri hardly ever. I have a 5S. I'm not a, I just don't like to talk to the devices. I would rather have some other way of doing it, a rotary twist and push or mm -hmm. screens or whatever have you. Um, and because I'm the same way. I, I'm afraid I'm going to punch a hole in that expensive 8.4-inch screen, <laughs> and I don't want to get into that, you know. Mm -hmm. So, But that's what people want. And, and the, the, the argument here with AAA is the automakers have claimed eyes on road, hands on wheel. Voice controls are the safest way to go. And what, what, what AAA is saying is, no, they are so complicated and they fail so often that you're so focused on trying to get the thing work, it, you, you are overcome with something they call inattention blindness. Things happen in front of you and you don't see them. The little girl runs out in front of your car and you're so focused on trying to get your radio station that you run her down. And if you'd have just pushed the preset button, you'd have had your eye on the road. See, but, but they'll have sensor systems that'll detect the little girl while you're busy <laughs> yeah. calculating what so it is. So it's okay, mean. you don't have well, to pay attention. That's why we're uh, barreling down the road to autonomous cars. Mm -hmm. right. Because we know people are going to be distracted. There's no putting that tube, uh, toothpaste back mm -hmm. in the tube. It's true. So, you know, we just, we've just got to make it through the next 10 years before that happens. And those of us who've survived that, well, you know, will be better off and less mm -hmm. likely to die on the road because... You know, we just want to live inside a mobile phone. Yes. Well, okay, so speaking of autonomous cars now, um, Tesla is going to be introducing something today, the Model D. Now, this will be for those of you listening today live. Um, so it's going to be at 7 p.m. Pacific, which would be 10 p.m. Eastern. So what's your guesses? What's it going to be? You guys did some reporting on We did. We have a little bit of it. Um, uh, I, I don't expect this is the biggest piece of it, but they will have some announcements on adding autonomous car features. They have recently outfitted cameras in their car starting in, in September, uh, including one in, in the windshield that looks forward, so they'll be able to do lane keeping, um, adaptive cruise control, things that you can find on uh, you know, Mercedes S-Class and a lot of mm -hmm. upscale um, cars right now. Um, they're getting in the game with that that will give them the building blocks they need to add more autonomous features in the future. Mm -hmm. Do you hear anything? Well, I mean, you know, the Model X is coming, and that will be four-wheel drive. It's it's a no-brainer to be able to make that available, you know, to, to the, the Model S as well. So, I, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if that's part of the whole. So so more of a supercar for the to, to take the Model S Not even and a supercar. I mean, as you notice, I mean, Jaguar was desperate to get four-wheel drive so they could sell cars in the north, you know, and, right. and this is a rear-wheel drive car, too. So they, they, it's just only a matter of time. So I wouldn't be shocked if it was something along those lines. Mm -hmm. But Elon does a great job whipping up hysteria, doesn't he? He is just a see, master. See, and I, you know, and I, you know, I mean, I, I was reading that there's a possibility that, you know, that it would be a sub- Three seconds, zero to sixty, and right, this that's is what they'd, they'd be yep. getting, and then the autonomy. And I was thinking to myself, well, okay, but is that big enough for Tesla? Okay, grand I mean, enough, right? I mean, is, is there have to be something even more special? Yeah, um, rocket, rocket cars. He'll make a merger of SpaceX and, and Tesla. And although, although he 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 didn't. He said in an interview yesterday that he he did, wasn't for a flying car, so it's, okay, it's not. There that we go. Okay, so be, strike that out. Oh, yeah. because, because, but I thought there was there was one. It was, it was sort of cute. He said because things could fall on the out of the sky and hit you in the head. There you the, go. Well, there's that's that's, that's where a distraction that's, leads that's, to a problem. I, I don't want the gravity working against me too. You yeah. know, I mean, you throw a pop can out the window or something. And, but but you know, he got all of this whipped up with a tweet. Mm-hmm. Well, which seems to be his his approach to PR. Yes, which which seems to have driven Simon Spruill out of there. Simon Spruill is off to Aston Martin after yeah, so six months at. at, uh, at yeah, so so we, a few weeks ago on the show, we were talking. For those of you who don't know, Simon Spruill, who was at Nissan with the aforementioned Mr. Gowen, um, and then he left there and went to Tesla. Right. And now he's gone to. Aston, Aston Martin. Martin. Aston Martin. Right. Right. So. And following one of his Nissan colleagues. So. so so, we had been thinking when he went from, from Nissan to Tesla was that he wanted to move back to the United States because he'd been in the United States. He but, worked for Ford once upon a time in right. JAG. And, so. and then he is a Brit. Right. So now and he he's, apparently rented the entire time he was in California. Mm -hmm. 
And so now he's moved back to the UK. And Andy Palmer, who's now running Aston Martin, used to work at? Nissan. With there we go. Simon. Yeah, exactly. So, so, and Simon also in this situation, he's becoming the CMO, the chief marketing officer. So it's more than a communications job. Mm -hmm. uh, so he, he makes a, a move up in um, position and responsibility, although a move down in volume. Oh my, yes, <laughs> that's yeah. putting it mildly. Yes. All right, so, so here's, here's, my, here's my question, and I think this will probably be the final question because we're running out of time here. Okay, so, so Tesla sells like this many cars, right? Right. And, and there are companies, say Nissan, that sells this many cars. Everybody talks about these guys. Right. And you, you very little is ever said about these guys. Right. Now, there are lots of cars, companies that sell this many cars, right? right? And nobody talks about them. You know, we wouldn't have talked about Aston Martin unless... You talk about Pioneers. I'll bet there were a lot so you think bigger buggy whip is? companies in the turn of the last century than Henry Ford. But if you have somebody who's pioneering and he has found a way to sell an electric car, um, you know, broadly, I'm not going to say to the masses because it's a luxury car, but it's in the race. If you if you put it up against other sixty thousand dollar cars, it's a good volume car, and um, and so uh, he's found a way. And and nobody else, Carlos Ghosn, everybody has tried electric cars mm -hmm. and hasn't been successful. He has. What do you think? Exactly. It has to be that and the the dynamic personality, and you know, people hang on his every tweet to see you know. And so he's just one of those. Rock star people, and he's you know earned the credibility by you know docking with the space station and introducing a car company in the same year. I mean, you know that earns a lot of respect, and yeah. you know gets people following your Twitter feed. Yeah. You know? So, yeah, hmm. I don't know that he's super duper easy to work with because it seems like he goes through people. Sure, in yeah. there, but yes, mm -hmm. but an interesting guy, and uh, I'm sure that. Perhaps Henry Ford wasn't the easiest guy to work with either. Exactly. Not that I'm saying Elon Musk is Henry Ford, by the way. But just no. Yeah. So with that, I guess we'll wrap things up. So uh, Keith, they can find your stuff at uh, where? Well, Bloomberg.com, Businessweek.com, all those good Bloomberg places. Motortrend.com. Motortrend.com. Okay. And even on newsstands as well. You mean like ink yes, on paper? Yes, dead trees. So they don't have to listen to it. We in, still do though. Don't have to listen to it in their car. Yes, but we are have we have podcasts and you know, radio and YouTube. We're everywhere. We have that too, by yeah. the way. Can I make one more plug? Sure. I have an ebook coming out on Monday. Uh, it's on Amazon. It's called Reckoning to Revival, and it's about the comeback in the American auto industry. Really? Yeah. Well, good for you. I'll so, have to look for that. So you can read it on your Kindle or on your... Uh, it is an E-only book. Is an e -book. Should we read Brock Yates' The Decline and Fall right before we... Yeah, exactly, that? as a companion piece. Yeah. yeah, I'm sure they'll be <laughs> pairing them on, on Amazon. Mm -hmm. Okay, so. well, guys, thank you very much for being here, and uh, it's been great Always having you. Always a pleasure. You. And for those of you at home or wherever you're watching us, um, in your car perhaps, no, we don't want you to do that. Um, we'll see you here next week. Good night. Auto Line After Hours is brought to you by Bridgestone, your journey, our passion. And by Hyundai. See what makes Elantra so nice. Check out its style, interior space, fuel economy, and popular features now. Visit our website, autoline.tv, where you can watch us live Thursday nights at 6 p.m. Eastern. Get your daily news fix with Autoline Daily and in-depth analysis and interviews with Autoline this week. There's all that and much more at Autoline.tv.